I am. Um, so today we're here to talk about working with LGBTQIA communities and just talking about this alphabet soup that um, that yeah that is a part a big part of community. So people that identify with these identities are in every single different like sector of community. It's very intersectional. We're going to talk about that soon too. Um, so just to like get a gauge of like who oh is that water? All right, just to get a gauge of how y'all are feeling when it comes to knowledge around LGBTQIA information on a scale from one to five, one being like, nope, really, this is brand new information for me. Five being like, wow, I'm an expert. You should leave, Jackie. I'm going to take over. <laughs> or, or you just feel really confident. Um, yeah, how are people feeling about this topic, one to five? Just like show of hands. Okay, awesome. Okay, cool. There's like a, a fair spectrum in this room right now, which I kind of assume, you know, that people are going to have some access to information about this. So some of this is going to be repeat information or maybe, um, yeah, something that, something that you've heard a little bit about before and some of it uh, might be brand new. So I have a lot of empathy, uh, which is what makes me a facilitator in this space. Um, I assume that people just are getting are, are coming at this at, from different places and so I um, feel like I can hold a space that allows for people to ask questions and um, use this time for learning while still having like a critical learning environment so I'll commit to that um, some other things to think about oh just like some fair little guidelines that I like to frame session with is like lean with curiosity that um and what that means is just like not making a lot of assumptions right that's a practice that family tree has to do a lot and like a practice like a muscle memory practice is is letting people decide who they are and what they need right so like we can't assume anything about what a person wants or what they need so yeah leaning with curiosity <coughs> it's a nice practice here and also in practice all right um, oh, okay, so this topic is, and, and actually, like, the way that gender and sexual orientation, the way that that plays out in, in society is really defined by that particular society. And this looks really different in different places in the world. Um, there are a few videos, actually, that we're not going to be able to play today, but I have them in the resources, so that show, like, different examples of, um, gender expression in different cultures too. Um, so do check that out, the resources. But the way that I am framing this today is in like rooting this conversation is how this plays out in the United States. However, you're working with people that come from all over the place, right? So I want that to be a part of the conversation as well. Um, so at any point you you make a connection, right? To like work that you're doing or strategies that you've done to work with people with um, like somewhere in this community where's my pointer bam somebody that identifies with one of these identities um, yeah let's let's talk about it I want to make this time to be useful for all of us um, and I really feel that there's expertise in the room as well so let's I, I hope that I can learn something now I also can talk for four hours straight no problem um, but I get bored listening to my own voice <laughs> so so yeah feel free to interrupt me um, like we can do back and forth yeah like I'm, I'm pretty informal all right yeah so family tree <clears throat> we we uh, we start like, our clinic is started in like 1971 or 1972 but in 2009, Family Tree initiated prior prioritizing gender identity and sexual orientation, inclusion, and access throughout the clinic. This is 2009, so a little under 10 years ago. Um, this was a clinic-wide commitment at all levels, which is re really necessary for it to be able to have like weight to it. Um, 
because at every step of where people engage with the clinic, whether it's with services or whether it's like the grant writing that, that we do, all of it has to have this um, priority um, as far as um, our initiative goes. Um, that means we've done some consistent evaluation, measurement, and assessment. Um, also, we have to be open to consistent change. That's been like, to me, it seems like that is the commitment. Is like a commitment to be shifting and changing all the time because information and people shift and change all the time. So it's kind of nice. You like you don't have to be an expert because people. I mean, y yes, you do. You definitely need to be aware of a lot of things, but people are going to drive the services that they need and that they want. Um, so it, like we really have an allyship with our patients. Uh, we did a case study and with this organization called the Rainbow Health Initiative, and they created some standards for inclusive practice and clinical care. And you can check that out. That's um, uh, Rainbow Health Initiative, and they have, they, they'll like send you copies of their standards of inclusion. Um, and then taking some action, uh, changing our demographic forms and collecting data. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later and why that's so important. Um, changing our restrooms, making them gender neutral, and then making sure that our identity is reflective of the patients that we serve as well. So like brochures and our website and being really, really um, consciously choosing the imagery and the way that we uh, show who we are, the way that we express ourselves and our identity. Bam. Here is a few little selections from our patient satisfaction survey. Being inclusive, making me feel normal. <laughs> you are a normal person, that's awesome. Um, I have never been asked if I have a specific gender identity, pre preferred pronouns, and then if I have a menstrual cycle. And it felt absolutely wonderful to have that distinction made. So a lot of times people will assume just because somebody identifies as male that they're not gonna have a menstrual cycle. When we see a lot of patients that are transgender, and they do, they have a uterus and they're male at the same time. So we're able to make the distinctions. And we're, I'm gonna, also I'm saying a lot of words right now and we're going to get some real nitty gritty like definitions and stuff later. Um, last two, great to see my community of trans and queer people uh, right as I walked in the door, lots of resources. I feel safe here. I come here with my most vulnerable questions and concerns and don't have to hesitate to say anything. So like, when we all do better, we all do better, to quote Paul Wellstone. Um, and when services are inclusive of all identities, and even, like, especially for people as identities that are more socially marginalized, <clears throat> If, if we are seeing those patients and everybody else that has more social access is still cared for as well. So people are feeling safe here just because we're making these, these I think, very simple changes. All right. Health disparities among LGBT people are rooted in bias, stigma, discrimination, and social determinants of health not genetics or other molecular issues. So we're talking about a population of people that really is left out a lot in society. Um, and in healthcare, because of the social determinants, which like, when, when I say that, what do you all think of? Like when I say social determinants of health, like what, what kinds of things might that be? Education, Education access for sure. Income. Income. Definitely going to get you access, right? Or lack of access. Um, the neighborhood that somebody was born in, right? Like all of these are things that are going to, that are social things that they might not have chosen for themselves, but they affect their health, right? So it's not that people that identify as like lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, well, intersex is a little bit different actually because that has to do with chromosomes, so we'll talk, that one's a little bit on the side here. But we're just talking about human beings, right, that have, uh, that have an identity, uh, but we're talking about humans. And so the, the ways that our society 
interacts with people that identify on the LGBT spectrum is that's where, that's where the health disparities happen. And there are a lot of health disparities. Um, I'm not even really trying to read all this um, because this is very limited. Um, the health, like, I chose these just because they were on Healthy People 2020, which is a really awesome website um, and resource. But there are a lot of intersectional health disparities that affect this community. And I'm leaving out a lot. So really, you have homework <laughs> um, to learn about it, um, to learn about why people and how people are experiencing health access. Um, these resources, like, I will send these slides to you all. You'll have access to them. And all these resources, and there's a slew of resources at the final page, too. So you'll have access to all of this. So check this out, especially <laughs> if you're a person um, who doesn't identify with all of these letters, uh, but anybody, we can, it's really great to learn about um, the people that we're serving and what they're experiencing. Um, homework, that's right. No, oops, animation. Okay. Uh, all right, so I, I mentioned intersectionality a few times. Does anybody have like a loose definition of, of how they think about intersectionality or what that means to them? Who's heard of the word intersectionality? Okay, sweet, sweet, sweet. Okay, so the idea behind intersectionality is that all of us have a lot of different identities. Everybody in this room has a different identity. And sometimes we lead with certain identities. Sometimes we, um, yeah, sometimes we might hold space in like a specific group, and be like, oh yeah, this is my group of people of color. But I also can't take off the fact that I'm a pretty feminine looking person, right? So those two things, actually, they can't be taken away from each other. They actually exist together. And that's how the world sees me, um, aside from all my other identities. I'm not kind of using myself as an example here. like. I am also Caribbean, right? So I'm Jamaican, and when people see me, they might not guess that right away, that I was born, or I was born here but lived in a small village, right? But that's a really big part of my identity and like how I see the world and how I make my decisions. Um, and I can't take that away. So this is a very, intersectionality essentially also talks about our identities in relationship to power. So everyone is intersectional. Everybody has an intersectional identity. I mean, if you think about this right now, about how many different identities that you hold sitting in this chair, um, but not everybody is visible, right? So intersectionality also has to do with the systems of power that uh, play out and affect a person's access. So somebody that has more socialized identities that have a lot of privilege, well, they're just gonna have more and more access. They get more and more access. So like, what are some identities that hold a lot of privilege in this culture? Male. Male. White. White. Rich. Class. Rich. What else? Upper middle class. Upper middle class. Rich. Educated. Educated. Whoa. Access. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, and then, uh, honestly, with, for people with uh, socially marginalized identities, it's a lot of people of color people that are transgender, especially feminine people, um, people that are poor, people that um, have different abilities. There's, and so when people have more and more of these intersecting identities that are socially marginalizing, or socially marginalized in our culture, then they're gonna have less and less access to health services, to jobs, um, to all the things that really provide like a healthy human being, it's just that much harder for them to have access to it. So this is like where we come in, you know, and seeing identities and lifting up the voices of people that are, that are often marginalized is gonna help us be more inclusive in the care that we, that we offer and then a healthier community. So there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Auntie Audrey Lord, if you're not familiar. She's not really my aunt, but 
I like to claim her. Uh, intersectionality is a way of thinking about identity and its relationship to power, and it is the acknowledgement that different forms of identity-based discrimination can, com can combine to give rise to unique brands of injustice. And, um, let's see here. Oh, here's a little image of intersectionality. Uh, so, what happens if we don't think intersectionally? People just get left out. And we're not offering inclusive care in our whole community. Um, and when we benefit, the way that we benefit from thinking about intersectionality is that we're just more inclusive when we're offering care to our whole community and seeing the community as a whole. When we all do better, we all do better, really. All right. Some barriers to inclusion. Systems, we talked a little bit about this, but reinforcing and erasing the um, LGBTQ community. So even like, actually I'm just gonna kind of talk about this in general because when we have data, data tells us that people exist. And right now, electronic health records, if people don't have places, to add like a person's gender identity, and especially if it's not within the binary of like male or female, then we're not even collecting that these people like exist in our world when they do. Um, and if we don't have data about people actually existing, then we can't apply for funding to create programming to support people. Right? So the erasing of data and identities has really big community impact on our ability to provide services. So at Family Tree, one of the things that we're really working on is collecting data and being able to name, like, oh, these are the people that we see. Uh, like, I think in the 2020 census, um, gender identity and sexual orientation was taken off. So it's terrible. It's like really literally erasing people in history. Um, yeah, what's on your mind? So, uh, I work for Health East part-time. When I register clients or patients, I ask, how do they identify? Versus, yes. versus asking them, are you male or female? I ask how they identify so I can document. But then when I get to the point if somebody says they don't identify as either, there's no option. So is that one of the changes or things that you're trying to... I appreciate this so much. First of all, shout out to you for not assuming, right? Like right. the way that a person the identifies. On the phone does not mean, you know, the time that I'm talking to a male and it's a female, you know. So I wish I, I could put want. what you just said on a billboard. <laughs> um, but, you know, just from working in the youth industry and working with, with trans kids and expecting, ex um, respecting my coworkers on how they identify. Yes. Yeah. So the first thing, yeah, asking people, right, let it, instead of assuming, like, how they identify. But yes, at Family Tree, that's exactly what we're having to work on is, like, for our intake forms, we just have blanks, you know, for people to, to write in. But then in our electronic health records, it's a little bit more complicated. Right. So right. We, have, um, we have a little bit of a workaround using the nickname, uh, a, a nickname bar. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't use EHR, so... I'm a little bit a little bit distance from how each art works, but I know that we have found some strategies on being able to be able to label a person's identity and the name that they want to use, or their name, um, and and their identity for us to be able to be consistent with that. So there is some strategizing that has to be done. Like you can have your own intake form, right? But then how does that then translate to the larger systems? Right. Because that's even that's a another layer of challenge that we're having now because if we have a person who's male and needs a pap smear, a pap smear might not come up as an option for right. service for a person that is identified as male. Right. So there are some larger systematic changes that need to happen that we are working on um, in the little bit of capacity that we have to shift those things. And we have seen some, like, I've seen some uh, some movement, I can't name names, especially since this might be on YouTube, but there have been some insurance companies that we've been in conversation with that are starting to work on shifting this to how actually humans live their lives. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
other barriers to inclusion, traumatic or alienating experiences with health, um, heteronormative or gendered assumptions. So like your example was really awesome, which was like the exact opposite of this, but this is often what people get when they go to the doctor. Because not, um, I will argue that medicine doesn't really spend a whole lot of time on this particular identity development and learning about these groups of people, unless you really specifically have that a part of your practice. Um, and so the industry is really heteronormative. And because of that, we hear a lot of stories, a lot of stories about people trying to access health and being treated really poorly and even like having traumatic experiences. Um, so that is something that also makes them not want to go back to the doctor. Uh, so thinking about that too, your patients are people that experience trauma potentially. Right? especially if we have people that have identities that are socially marginalized, that's just something to know about them, you know, to be considered about, about what they might be coming in with. And then I kind of mentioned this too, lack of buy-in from the medical institutions. So staff competency is really important. Um, we, we do that at Family Tree with our volunteers, our board, our staff, all levels of employees. Okay. So now we're going to get into some, wait, how are y'all doing? Y'all doing okay? Any questions or anything so far? Okay, cool. So I have, how many people have seen this image? Cool, okay, cool. I have some of these in Spanish too. I think like five of them. Judy, could you help me pass this? Yes. Sorry. All right, so this is a gender unicorn. Does anybody need one in Espanol? Okay. Where do I put these? Great, because I have them. Aha! Jeez Louise. Okay. This was uh, the only, the other language I could find it in is Russian. Spanish, English, and Russian. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, thank you so much. We're going to talk about gender identity and, whoops, and just like about this the acronym, LGBTQIA, we're gonna talk about it. And this image is one that I think is really, well, first of all, it's colorful and fun to look at, and that's just great, because it's not boring. Um, but it, it does a good job at explaining the differences of what we're talking about here. Okay, so LGBTQIA, this like, and there's actually more letters. If we ever wanna add them, we can. Um, L G B. What's L stand for? G B. Okay. What are those things describing? Sexual preference. Sexual preference. Some people call it sexual orientation, sexual preference, who somebody might be into, or sexually. Um, okay, and then we have the T. T stands for what? Transgender. Transgender. And what is what does that have to do with? What is what does that mean? Identity. identity. It's your identity. It's your gender identity. So not sexual orientation. It's a person's gender identity, right? Their person. Q. What might Q stand for? Mm -hmm. Queer. Questioning. Yep. Um, so the word queer. First of all, which. This is the first time I've heard like this many people say this in a room together because sometimes this, this word is a very generational, very generational. So um, I think especially for people that are older, that word was a word that was used to hurt them. And so definitely whenever I'm working with a person who's a little bit older, um, I'm really careful about using that word because it can, it can definitely hurt. Um, and for younger people, I notice that what they, they really find 
a lot of power and and um, fit, like it fits. It's like some, a lot of, the way that I see it is that the word queer tends to be like an umbrella term that can fit like a community connection. Like, oh, this is this is like a part of who I am. These like this type of person who might live whether like in a sexual orientation that is LGBT or maybe somewhere like around all of that. It's just like a a nice umbrella term is the way that I have seen it. Or it can just be an identity. Um, okay, so that's the Q. I, what does the I stand for? Intersex. 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 Um, anybody know anything about intersex or intersex conditions? Yeah. Just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, one of my son's best friend's little sister was born um, with both parts. Uh, Sure, know, with an intersex on. condition. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and she now identifies as a, a female, even though she looks. She has some parts that are male, but she plans on having a surgery for that. So. Okay, so you explained it pretty nice. I mean, like, intersex has to do with the uh, uh, chromosomes mm -hmm. and how, like, what a person is born with. So we're talking about biology and science here, um, which is not necessarily a gender identity and not a sexual orientation like the LGB, right? So this is a person's chromosomes. And then A, what does the A stand for? Asexual, asexual I've heard of. Um, and what does asexual mean? Anybody want to share what they think about that? So asexual, a person identifies as asexual um, is, and this is like a varying experience, is not really interested in sexual engagement with another person. Um, okay, and then also ally, I've heard A's for ally. Okay, so we went through a this like alphabet letters here, and one thing that I uh, feel is that it's confusing because we're talking about a lot of different types of experiences, but yet it's all kind of clumped together right? But a person's sexual orientation is very different than their gender identity, which is very different than like their chromosomes. All those different things have such diversity among them. And so this image that you're looking at right now talks about how or shows, illustrates the diversity of how this can actually be exercised in a human body. All right. So the first one on the top, oh, wait, let me make a little disclaimer about this image. This is a unicorn, not an actual thing. Humans are actual people that exist on the planet, not fantasiful characters, <coughs> right? So I just want to make that statement that we're talking about real people here with identities that actually exist. Um, this unicorn is just a representation thereof. Okay, uh, even though it doesn't exist. <laughs> okay, so the first one, gender identity, if you look at your uh, paper. Gender identity, what, is, what does that have to do with? It's okay. Who you are. Ideas. Who you are as a person. It's like this innate sense of like, this is who I am. This is who I identify as. And oftentimes people identify that or develop that internal identity at a really young age. Really young age. Um, People could identify as female, woman, girl. They could identify as a man, a boy, or all different genders as well. And that's something that has to do with inside your own mind, right? So I can't go up to somebody and say, oh, your gender identity is this. Because I can only be in my own brain, right? So that's your gender identity. Your gender expression, what is, what's that? How you, show how you show yourself, how you present yourself. Um, they can, and there's also a spectrum here, feminine, masculine, other. And people can kind of turn that crank up on some, on one of these. Some people might be like, okay, in fact, I'm going to use myself as an example today. <laughs> I'm totally using myself today. Uh, today, I feel like, I don't know, how do y'all feel? I'm feeling like I'm kind of like here. Because I'm wearing a dress. I'm wearing kind of like fatigue pants. Um, these boots, I don't know, semi-androgynous, maybe-ish. 
So I might, but I got like longish hair and I'm wearing earrings and jewelry and stuff. Um, now, by our, this is all defined by society, right? This is all defined by society. And I will also say that our society is constantly shifting and changing. Right, so the way that, especially with working with young people, you you learn that quick. Oh my God! You know, <laughs> you just have to constantly be on your toes, or really just kind of open to move, um, because we see people that uh, define themselves as masculine and dress in skirts, right? Like uh, Will Smith's kid. What's his name? Jaden. Jaden Smith. Masculine dude but wears skirts, identifies as a guy, I think. I, I don't know, I might be wrong. I haven't, I haven't seen anything with Jaden recently. But from what I understand, this is like a, the way that our culture is starting to move and shift around because I, I would, that's not something that has, was existed like 50 years ago. Right? Well, it did, but it wasn't as loud, not as heard as much. All right, um, so that's gender expression. The sex somebody was assigned at birth, um, there is, there tends to be a little bit of a binary conversation here. People really assume that people are either born male or female, um, but there is also other things. There's other ways to be born. And so a person that is born with XX chromosomes is usually what? Chromosome quiz. Girl. That's the doctor's like, you're a girl. They might see a vulva, see a vagina, and be like, you're a girl. Um, uh, if a doctor or a baby is born and a doctor sees a penis, the uh, XY chromosomes, uh, they're like, you're a boy. Now, most people don't get chromosome checks when they're like brand new babies. Because if they look at the <coughs> genitals of a child, they're going to make assumptions. But um, when it comes to intersex conditions, people, there are a whole lot of different kinds of intersex um, uh, conditions. And uh, like people that uh, essentially there are different chromosomes that they're born with. Or maybe they might not even, they might not have receptors to uh, take in the, the hormones that are growing in their body, right? So like say a person um, is born with a vulva and a vagina, but also has uh, testes internally, right? And they might get testosterone, but they might not have the receptors for testosterone. So the testosterone is just kind of swimming around in their body and they have testicles still. Um, that's one type of intersex condition. And there are, like I said before, there are a lot of different types. Um, about the, the common place of people with intersex conditions are about the same amount of people that are natural redheads. Um, that's like a, you'll hear that analogy a lot, but it's like 1% of the population, which is significant. You know, like this is, these are people that are around us. All right. Um, and oh, I will say that too, oftentimes people that are intersex, um, Oftentimes, doctors will perform surgeries on them without their permission. Um, but for people that are transgender, they have to fight for the types of procedures they want to feel to be who they are, right? So very different experiences here and very different, yeah, very, very different experiences. Okay, and then we have who a person is physically attracted to, that's like their sexual orientation, and who they're emotionally attracted to, which I think is just another sweet layer of this. Um, and uh, yeah, these are like all different ways that people can express their identities. All right, we've got some names here. Oh wait, hold on, let me go back to this. Any questions? How are we doing here? What's on your mind? Anything? I can do offline. Let's go. No, come on. We got some time. Um, the inter the intersexual thing. Yeah, um, intersex. Intersex. Yep. Um, because my mom is lesbian, but she she always talks about as a child she knew she was not attracted. So you're saying that there could have been testing done on her chromosome? Not for her. No, I no. mean so like your your identity, like your sexual orientation, mm -hmm. that can be. 
that can be something that you, it's not something you can test for, but it's definitely something that you can know at a really young age. Um, and it also is something that can change throughout a person's life. Um, like, I think, it, so I ask people, so like a person who, who identifies as like heterosexual, right? Um, they can think back and be like, oh, I remember just being attracted to these people and I was attracted to people of different gender as, as, as they were or whatever. Um, it can be as simple as that. It's just that they're they just attracted to somebody of a, the same gender or someone who's gender non-conforming or whatever. But in this case, you're talking about your mom is a lesbian. So this kind of proves more of what I was saying is that all these identities, when they lump all these letters together, mm -hmm. it makes it seem like they are more connected than they actually are. Because someone's sexual orientation, I mean, that's... That is something that is like separate from like their chromosomes because somebody can identify as male, female, or intersex and be a lesbian. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like <clears throat> even though like we're having a discussion, I totally feel like it's very valid to, to put these together because our society kind of does that. So it's nice for us to just be able to deconstruct it and be able to say, oh, okay, actually, we're working with different things. And so the, the whole point of this, too, is because we're working with, these are all different things, even though our culture like lumps them all together, one thing cannot make then assumptions about another part of the person's identity, right? So just because a person, um, their gender expression is feminine, doesn't mean that they're gonna wanna date a man. Right, like mm -hmm. they might want to date somebody else, like who is not gender conforming, or like is a woman, or whatever, or like, like I mentioned before, like just because somebody identifies as a man, maybe they were assigned female at birth and they have periods, right? But they're they're male. So knowing that each of these exists within itself, on its own, on its own. And, and it can, it really informs us about who they are, but it can't make help, it can't um, make us make assumptions about other parts of how their identity is expressed. Does that kind of give a little bit of yeah, response? I was, I was like, so maybe they never tested to see if she had something else inside of her. Oh yeah, this is so totally she, different. Yeah. totally masculine sometimes too, and then she has a feminine side, and I was like, oh, well, I'm yeah. gonna some tests. Because maybe she was right. She was always, uh, you right. Know, I'm selfish. like getting this now. I appreciate this <laughs> this question because it's like just because a person is like feminine, identifies as lesbian, but they also are kind of like masculine, yeah, right? Like hard in a minute. To <laughs> right, right, totally. It doesn't mean they're intersex, right? Like mm -hmm. they can still just have the chromosomes like XX right. and be like biologically. Yeah. In excuse me, in healthcare, are there clinics that target the specific of the alphabet? Oh, like, like, like specifics, lesbian. Ah, uh, or there is so like, there's the Fenway Institute in Boston. They're really awesome. Um, they're not a lot. I'll Nothing just locally, say. Though. Yeah. I mean, Family Tree. We really focus a lot of our care on LGBTQ community, but that's but we also see a lot of other people too. I understand that. I guess yeah. I'm, what I'm asking is, if somebody mm. feels that they're here on this spectrum, mm. and I fall pretty, you know, if I fall pretty dead on one of these elements, yeah, there. But we are not specifically treating people right now. I haven't seen anything so, like that. I never thought of that. I'm before. seeing a lot of shaking heads in the crowd, so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I do know that there are people that like have specialties, right. you know, certain practitioners. All right, cool. Assumptions only make an ass out of you and me, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, here are just some more identities and labels. Uh, sexual orientation. This is, um, you know, it could be a person's identity too. You know, sometimes people really have 
like a lot feel connected to the the label gay or lesbian out of like pride or just like it fits well. Um, so it could be an identity, but also has to do with your who you're attracted to and like the behavior a person does. Um, and these are different sexual orientations. Bi. What does bi mean? Sexually attracted to people on all on the spectrum. Okay, so bi means two, and it's I like the way that you said this too because it's like. Bisexual also only just means two genders, and we know that, that gender is something that is more of a spectrum, which is kind of like what you said, you're like this. <laughs> it's just kind of like how I like to physically describe it too. Um, but yeah, bi means two. Two-spirit, anybody know what that means? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, where have you heard? Um, bi oh, back here, oh, my bad, back there. Oh, yeah. in the it's like, the <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Right, okay, so Two-Spirit has to do with, um, it's really specifically, only indigenous people can use that terminology. Um, and it has to do with, yeah, embodying different spirits, different gender experiences in one person. But really, and I really want to reiterate that it is just for native indigenous people. Um, lesbian or gay, somebody who is a, uh, a person that's a, same-sex interest. interest. Uh, pan. Pan means all. So pan uh, kind of gets to this thing. You know, the like, it's, all, it's everything. Pan means every single person. It could be a person who's feminine. It could be a person who's trans-feminine. It could be a person who's not gender-conforming or male or anything. Asexual, we talked about that a little bit. Um, Queer, we talked about that a little bit, and fluid, and many more. So um, I just wanted to talk a few about a little bit about this. Transgender, trans means across. So it means a person was born with uh, the sex that they were assigned with at birth, and they grow up and they're like, actually, that's that does not fit for me. Actually, I am this, they cross to the gender that they actually are, even though they might have been born with the body parts of the gender that they don't uh, identify with. Um, and people that identify as transgender might identify as transgender. They might identify as a trans woman or a trans man. They also might just identify as a woman or a man. Uh, here there are different, there are so many actually like non-gender conforming identities. These are just a few. Gender variant, gender fluid, gender queer, gender expressive. I've also been hearing a lot more lately with younger people, like with little littles, like gender creative for kids that are like, I'm not a boy or a girl. I'm just, I'm just creative. I'm gender creative. And honestly, when young people have access to different types of gender experiences, they also grow up having a lot of varying skills that allow them to have access to like a whole self, you know, and, and like, yeah, just emotional skills and tactile skills and not missing any type of skill that has to do with being a human. Um, and then cisgender. Cisgender has to do with a person is born and they identify with the sex that they were assigned with at birth, and that fits for them, that their genitals um, match the gender that they were, uh, the sex that they were, excuse me, their gender is, uh, is um, aligns with the sex that they were assigned with at birth. And um, so that's cisgender, there could be a cis woman, a cis man, a woman, a man. And, then there are pronouns too, and pronouns are just like the way that people like to be referred to as. Like me, I use she, her, her pronouns. You can use those when referring to me. Um, you could also ask a person like, hey, what pronouns do you use? Or, or even reminding or asking for a reminder. Hey, could you remind me of what pronouns do you use? Uh, if, if you don't remember. Now, the tricky thing with this is that certain people get asked more than other people because they might not physically fit 
our society's description of what a woman or what a man looks like. And so that type, that person is just going to be asked potentially a lot more, more than like a person who looks like a woman or a man. Um, and so it really is an area where people can get, uh, can feel um, microaggression, essentially, is what that is. Um, this um, question or assumptions that really tack away in, on a person's identity, and it, it hurts. It hurts to be microaggressed when people make assumptions that are incorrect about who you are. Um, so do the work on remembering, too. That's really important. Um, when a person tells you their pronouns, try to remember. And if you don't, or if you make a mistake, you make a mistake and you move on. Um, okay, now I said all of this stuff, right? Like we went over this gender unicorn. Um, we talked about all these different identities. Uh, and I could be wrong about all of it <laughs> with the patient that you see. Because that happens to us all the time, where a person comes up and they talk about what kinds of things they need, and all the assumptions and things that we learned might be out the door. Roll with it, because that person is is where the care is centered, um, and and all this. I mean, really, this might shift and change as time goes on. Right now, this is current information, all right. But I'm just saying, really, is that um, you have to make sure to to let the patient decide who they are and how they identify and their experiences. All right, I'm gonna move on, but I'm gonna describe this activity that I was potentially gonna have us do and maybe you might think about it. Um, but I was going to have us talk to a partner about the things that you plan on doing this weekend without using any gendered language. It's not you know, if you have to talk about, like, your nephew, how do you talk about your nephew in a gender-neutral way? Anybody have an idea? Use the first name. Bam! Use the first name! That's, like, a nice gender-neutral thing to do if you don't know a person's gender. Use their name. Ask their name. Um, because, really, these, these identities are really personal, and we can't also assume that someone's just going to tell us their gender identity because we want to know, right? Like, our identities are very personal. Even though I shared with you all that I'm Jamaican today, you know, I might not just tell somebody that on the street, you know, if they just want to know. I got to decide on my own terms what I was going to share. Um, so yes, like I said before about assumptions, they can just make us look like jerks. All right. Um, there are some elements around um, trans, uh, transitioning or being transgender that I wanted to cover. Uh, there are some social elements. Clothing and presentation appearance can be really, really important to patients um, and finding resources to be able to be the person who they see themselves as and like look in the mirror and be like, yes, this is me. Um, that can be really important to trans patients. There are a lot of legal elements um, changing a person's name, getting their passport updated, an insurance updated, uh, birth certificate, all of those things allow you to maneuver around in our society. So the simple, simple thing of having your driver's license actually have your identity on it, your gender that is correct, and your correct name, um, that, I mean, your driver's license gets you so much access or, or, or denies you of access, especially when it comes to healthcare. Um, and so I'm, that makes me think a lot of people that are undocumented, right? Like, let's, if somebody is undocumented, or even if they're just being discriminated against for being an immigrant um, and not having access to insurance, like, if they don't have access to insurance, well, they're, they're not going to be able to have access to health. Um, and especially when you intersect that, Right? With the person who identifies as LGBTQ, we're talking about like potentially higher levels of depression, um, incidents of violence, um, higher levels of homelessness if you're a youth, right? And so like we need to be able to have access to health care if you're a person from this community. Remember, do your homework to learn about the disparities. Um, 
Medical, uh, there are a lot of different options. I'm going to talk about those in a minute. And then emotional, uh, responding to microaggressions and like having community, right? Like finding a social network, finding our people to keep us affirmed and supported. Um, so there's different things that people could do if they are trans. They can just be a human and be trans. Hey, there may be people in this room that do not know what a microaggression is. Oh my gosh, yes, totally. All right, so, um, yeah, anybody, like, like, let's talk about what that is. What is a microaggression? Anybody have an idea? Small comments that may not on the surface seem like anything offensive, but over time they build up. Yes, I really, thank you so much. So I like that it's like small, seems like seemingly small comments, right? You kind of like tacked away at somebody over and over again. It just is a, micro but it has a large impact especially over time um, and I think that oftentimes people that are doing the microaggressions might not know that they're doing it or even yeah just not cognizant of it at all um, but it still has really big impacts on a person so like I mentioned before like a person who um, is trans right um, I'm not trans uh, and if I'm with one of my friends, like one of my homegirls that's trans, she might get asked a lot more about her gender pronouns than I do. I should be asked too, you know, or like don't ask either of us, like, uh, you know, being consistent. And actually I would say be consistent, ask everybody, <laughs> because not everybody is going to have the gender that we assume they do. So it's best to just ask everybody or keep, yeah, being consistent with that. So microaggressions are something that, um, yeah, can hurt. Learn about that too. That's another thing that I would say check out about because microaggressions don't just have to do with gender. It has to do with all different kinds of identities, especially identities that are socially marginalized. Thank you for saying that. Okay. Um, People that are identify as transgender may or may not get um, any type of medical intervention. They might just identify as trans or they might just identify however they identify and that's it. So there's never an assumption that a person just because they identify as being transgender that they're going to have any kind of medical intervention. Um, but some things that people could do are hormone therapy, um, estrogen or testosterone. Um, there are different types of surgical procedures, gender affirmation sur surgery um, that has to do with a surgical procedure with a person's genitals. Uh, top surgery has to do with, it could be breast augmentation, it could be uh, double mastectomy, uh, removing breast tissue. And yeah, I guess different types of uh, bottom surgery. And gender affirmation surgery is really the proper way to say this because I think in previous years they would talk about like changing, but really it's about affirming their gender. So the surgeries are only there to, um, yeah, to affirm who they are. And there's different types of clothing, binding. Um, people might wear clothes that is to our society's um, assumption of like gender that makes them feel good present binding has to do with binding tissue down most likely breast tissue to be able to have like a flat chest packing has to do with um, either putting like any kind of material it could just be like any kind of like bulging material to be able to have a little bit of weight to show that they have like some package in someone's underwear um, or tucking to like move uh, genitals around so they have like a flat surface. There's all different types of ways that people um, want to present themselves and make them be the best person who they are and want to be. So the path to gender identity is really unique for every single person. Do not assume. We talked a little bit about pronouns. That's a priority. And then if you make a mistake, apologize and move on. Um, here are some little tips about apologizing and they are not um, to do it like in any specific order but I just feel like it's nice to have a little conversation about apologizing you know like that is something that can mean a lot to a person that has been hurt right and we don't want to hurt people 
But if we're learning, there are possibilities that we might make a mistake sometime, right? Um, so here are some options. Present a genuine heart, a little bit of vulnerability, right? Going with the person in an honest way. Uh, release your expectations. Somebody might not want to have a conversation with you, you know, if you want to apologize to them. That's, that's not their problem, okay? Like, seriously. So just release your expectations. Because if someone's feelings are hurt, they might not want to chat about it. Uh, acknowledge the rupture. Be honest about what happened, saying like, hey, I did this, and I just noticed this, and I just want you to know that I did. Be brief. It's kind of hard sometimes when, when, uh, when apologizing. Sometimes people feel like they want to explain, like, but here's the reason why I did it. I don't care. <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to hear somebody's reasoning why they hurt my feelings for five minutes. Um, that just feels like it's like re-hurting my feelings over again. So um, the impact is really important, right? The intent, kind of, but I would argue probably not the most relevant thing when apologizing to somebody. Uh, so be, be brief, especially like you mess up somebody's uh, pronouns, just being like, oh, I'm sorry I did that. Okay, I'm going to remember this. Let's move on. Don't grovel. Uh, embrace the awkward. You do that how you need to. It's just things are going to be awkward because you're being vulnerable apologizing, and that's totally okay. Um, I think that's actually really powerful. To me, vulnerability is really powerful because it, it shows that you're connecting with another person, you're reaching out to be with them, and that is revolutionary, really. To be vulnerable with the person that you hurt is really important. Um, suggest ways to make it up, maybe. I mean, don't ask them, don't put the work on them, <laughs> but that's just an option. And then learn from it. Change and shift, okay? I wonder how Bieber has done <laughs> okay. Um, all right. I'm like running really close out of time, but this has to do with sex positivity and all the education that comes out of Family Tree. We think about sex positivity, and what that means to us is just that people get to define who they are and what their experiences are, and um, and how they want to experience their sexuality as a whole. And it doesn't assume that people want to have sex or need to be sexual. It really says that people get to define who they are. And so that's really important to the education that comes out of Family Tree. And also, like, the services, is, 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 this informs the services, too. People define it. Um, all right. This is just some language. I'm going to let you guys look at that. OK, later. <laughs> um, and then this is the compass of shame. So. Something that can really come from a lot of LGBTQ experiences is shame because their identities are so socially marginalized that people, I mean, yeah, it could be mean to them and shame them. And that is not at all um, help people get access to support. Um, if a person feels ashamed about their identity, uh, they might not talk about it and then not access health. Um, they might withdraw, or they might do some self-harm, right? Like using substances excessively, um, or, or attacking others and being really, really loud, say, like maybe being really, really homophobic, right? Because they themselves are ashamed of their own identity. So um, this can play out in so many different ways. I'm just giving like the tiniest bits of examples, but shame really does not support any type of connection to healthcare. Um, so yes, creating spaces that feel inclusive of the people that we serve is helpful. And I don't know how much, um, I guess how much you have access to like creating a space where you work, um, but being able to have images that and images and language that includes people of varying identity and experiences really helps them feel like, oh, y'all were thinking of me too. Great, I am here. It's really affirming. So like chest exams, not just breast exams, or like get a pap. No matter if you have a cervix and what kind of identity you hold, if you have a cervix, get a pap smear. All right, here's just a quick example of our um, health history form, so preferred name, 
their gender identity all, and gender pronoun, all of that kind of stuff is worked in into the forms. And I also like this right here, even though it's just a small little sentence, please um, answer all that applies to you. It's like we're just always trying to affirm that like we're not making assumptions here that you have this experience but just so if this applies to you then go ahead and fill it out so tips for supporting lgbtq patients use inclusive language um, support disclosure about sexual orientation and gender identity um, that's actually one thing that i didn't add to this is and I, so I want to, I'm going to give y'all more homework. Um, check in on how to support a person coming out. There's a, there are a lot of resources for that, so I might just send you something. Okay, cool. Um, follow your patient's lead. Look at your environment. Um, see that if it's inclusive or not, and see what kind of representation you have. Understand the medical management of trans identities. Learn about that. Apply the knowledge of identity in treatment and discharge planning. Uh, differentiate between sexual orientation and gender identity. So like, um, don't assume just because a person is male that they don't want to get pregnant. Maybe they have a uterus want to get pregnant. Um, or that they're going to be like partnered with a specific person. Uh, acknowledge mistakes, remember everyone is different, and things can change. There are tons of resources, so you all will get these and can click on the videos and check them out. My name is Jackie, Jackie Trelawney, Family Tree Clinic. You can reach me here. All right, I used up more time than I was supposed to, so thank you all so much for having me. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all.